And then I was shown this other reality or dimension or potential for the world. And it was so, so beautiful. And it, it was just around the corner. It, it, it wasn't like, you know, this could happen if we're really good in 500 years. It, there was a simplicity to it, and there was a, a beauty to it, and there was an ordinariness to it. And what was most significant is the sense of joy returned again to life. Everything that is happening is just encouraging us and supporting us to step into all of who we are. And it's, it's like the whole universe is just there saying, come on, you can do it. And I stand in front of you now going, you know, the world's a pretty scary place right now. It's a really scary place right now. But there is also so much good. There is so much hope that if we can learn to come together and work with each other and we promote that which we know to be truth. And the one thing that we can hang our hat on is that we are all divine love and wisdom. So really the only job that you have right now is to raise your frequency. Because when enough people have stepped into the connection to their own divine essence. It's like a, a net over the earth. As each person steps into the truth of who they are, then they become a light on the net. And when there are enough lights, the whole earth will shift. You are all precious and beloved. Don't ever forget that. And everything that you do does matter to somebody else. Find out whatever it is that you do well and do it. Give to the world, give to your neighbors, give to others, because you have it within you. Everybody does. That special talent, that special gift. And God said to me, Erica, in life, I give each and every one of you gifts. And they're all different because that is part of my plan. Be you. What I want to share with people in this book, don't be afraid to be your authentic self. I'm pretty goofy and people like me pretty well. Just be yourself. That the most important thing for you is to always be yourself. Be as you as you can be. Shine your light as brightly as you can. Embrace your uniqueness. Just realize who you are, get to know who you are, love yourself unconditionally, and just be yourself. And with those five things, I invite you to go and live your life fearlessly. What are the greatest lessons you've learned here? Do what feels right, not what your head tells you to do. And never listen to other people when they tell you you have to do this and that. Do what feels right to you, not to other people. Otherwise, I would have become an office clerk. Because that's what your father said yeah. you had to be. Yeah, and he yeah. was a very bossy guy. He said, you do that, no question asked. And to say, learn how to say no early. Learn did that. how to say no early. You yeah. did that that by my being I simply was expressing absolute love and connectedness and unity and harmony with all of existence. And I was adding my particular and absolutely unique note to this grand song of life that reverberated throughout all existence. You don't need to go anywhere that betekende that ik volledig ben. Ik ben Vrijheid. Ik hoef het niet te veroveren. Niemand kan het van me afnemen. Ik ben het. En ik hoef ook nergens naartoe om die vrijheid terug te winnen.
All of the patients who go through this tell us that there is one thing that comes up to them as the most important feature in their life in these reviews. They say that it doesn't have anything to do with earthly success. No one asks them about their financial well-being or how much power they've had or, or any of these other things that our society suggests that we should be paying so much attention to. Every single person has told me that what they faced were faced with there, there was the question of how they had learned to love and whether they had put this love into practice in their lives. I was told very clearly what our purpose is. And your purpose is to love. It's that simple. Hard to pull off cleanly, but you are here to love. And I'm not just talking about the warm fuzzies. Most people, when you say the word love, they think warm fuzzies. Love is a far more uh, multi-dimensional, complex thing than just the warm fuzzies. Um, there, it's, it's very obvious. Everything is made out of love. Made out of it. Like... <laughs> This is love. This is an expression of God's love. And he said, love the person that you're with. And I said, okay. And he said, um, that's enough. And I said, um, how is it enough? And he said, if you do that, he said, you'll change the world. We all know what it feels like to be loved by someone and to have someone that, that we really care about and respect and that's a loving person when they walk into the room. You know what, how different that feels than being around somebody who's just always anger and bitter and hateful and resentful and does a lot of negative thinking. There's such a huge difference. So I think we all need to change that within ourselves. And that's what I learned. I need to change myself, and that changes the world. The only... The only fly in the ointment was is that I thought it was going to be easy and it turns out to be the hardest thing that I've ever done because um, it sounds so simple but it's really difficult it's easy it's like easy for me to love my mother because she was a really nice woman and she was a very loving woman so not hard to love someone who's really good and really loving but what do you do with someone who's um difficult or actually um, really nasty. I mean, th those are hard people to love. And what does it mean to love someone? I mean, sometimes to love someone means you need to incarcerate them. Yeah. And that doesn't, that's not like a lot of fun. Um, sometimes loving someone means you have to um, put as much distance between them and you as possible and tell them to never call you. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's not a lot of fun. I mean, it's, Loving people is, um, sounds so simple, but it's very difficult. It, it took me 10 years to really get over the grief, to really embrace love. And I, I think the key for me too, is even though I had had those profound experiences, I was still looking for joy and peace out there somewhere. Who can bring this to me? Tanya, if she could just love me enough to make me feel okay. Or if the boys could just love me enough to make me feel okay, or, or in my job, or whatever else I was grasping at to feel like I was wanted and I was loved and I was okay. Even though I had been in the arms of God and felt perfect, but I was still looking for it for an outside source. I, in fact, I was wandering around thinking, where's all that love I felt here? Where will I ever find it? And the key was when I finally looked within myself instead of looking out there. When I finally realized, oh, to love unconditionally, I, I, I get to love myself unconditionally. And when that happened, the healing began, because I was never going to find it out there. It had to be felt within. And... But the one thing that I feel like I cannot go wrong with is loving people. And no matter how hard that can be, to do at times, it can be really challenging and difficult, then I still have to go to that place where I felt that unconditional love coming from God and, and try to, to get that feeling in my heart and then send that out to other people. 
Um, that that's what it's all about there Jesus said to me that the, our purpose for being here on this earth is to learn to love and that that is one of the most important things um, that if we love one another everything else will be okay if there was one big thing that you think that we're all here to do what would that be to experience unconditional love to love unconditionally and to experience accepting unconditional love from other people. Our Earth, the world we live in right now, I was told, is a, like a classroom to learn to love. Not only ourselves, but to learn to love others as unconditionally as God loves us. Now that might seem to be a very simple thing. You think, okay, I can love. I love inside, I can love other people. That's not easy. Think about the people in your life. Are they easy to love? Heck no, I can tell you, my own children sometimes are difficult to love, right? They will present some of the greatest challenges on earth for you. The family that are right there in your unique, Little ripple will teach you the most in this life. And that saying that says, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Absolutely. And you know that that is true in your life as well. The teacher always appears when you are ready. And it's usually a challenging person. Someone that's just going to make you grit your teeth or shudder every time you're around them. You pass the test when you love them anyway. That doesn't mean to be a doormat. It doesn't mean that you lay down and let other people walk on you or scrape their feet on you. What that means is, because you can distance yourself from them, but what it means is you look into their soul and you see who they are. God's creation. I believe who we really are is a beloved, spark of our divine creator and that we are here to learn in a totally different realm and an environment than our eternal spirit spends time to magnify our understanding and our desire to be more and more loving and compassionate and caring and realizing that everyone we encounter is also that same beloved spark of God. Aan de ene was mensen hebben lief voor zover ze kunnen. En, en er zaten mensen om mijn bed heen en ze praten. En ik dacht, ze praten maar ze zeggen niks. Wat ze zeggen is niks over wat ze zullen doen, wat ze gaan doen, wat ze gedaan hebben, uh, wat ze niet gedaan hebben, wat ze zullen doen, wat ze niet zullen doen, hoe ze met vakantie gaan. En het was niks. Uh, het, het had geen inhoud. En ik voelde me ongelooflijk alleen. En toen begon die zin van mensen hebben lief voor zover ze kunnen, begon aan de deur te kloppen. Dat mijn alleen gevoel ook een signaal was dat ik meer van ze verwachtte. En dat ik moest aanvaarden dat mensen lief hebben voor zover ze kunnen. I believe that we are beautiful spiritual beings who are here for a very very brief time in these clay vessels to learn lessons for our souls and to learn how to love one another better. To learn how to treat each other the way that God wants us to treat each other. And then, I think we move forward. I believe that we are here with great purpose and on purpose. Do not think for a minute that you're an accident. And you were born to who you were born to. And you were with the people that you are with now as a great divine plan. We learn from our families 
a lot sometimes that we don't want to learn. But they are teaching us as hopefully we are teaching them. I believe we're here to take care of the earth too and all the animals, the plants, everything. And when we do that, my patients te teach me that it's not about getting an award. It's not about getting a pat on the back or applause. It's because it's our duty. I would step back and I could feel compassion. And I also, when I was re reviewing my own life, there wasn't judgment on my part. Peter, you should have been better. Why did you do that? How dare you do that? It was like, you could do a better job, Peter. I was kind to myself. But then something spectacular happened. Something amazing happened. I got the chance to see what I call the unsung hero. I got a chance to see doctors, nurses, teachers, housewives, vets, all those people doing deeds that no one else knew about. No one else knew what was going on. Just they were doing their job and doing the right thing because it is the right thing to do. Over and over in my consciousness, I kept feeling, you do the right thing because it is the right thing to do. Ask yourself that. Ask yourself that. Doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Because sometimes what I saw on the other side, I saw myself, I don't want to use the word failing, but just not shining. That when I came back to earth, I wasn't going to do anything phenomenal. I wasn't going to be on the Oprah Winfrey show. I wasn't going to sell 50 million copies of the world's greatest book. But what I was doing was from time to time, I would make someone's day a little bit brighter than it was before they met me. Yeah. But, but while I'm here, I just want to do some small things to help somebody as best I can in significant ways. They are insignificant, but meaningful. What was important were the choices that I made. And what was more important than, than just the choices that I made were my motivations and my intents and really the state of my heart in doing any single action. And I realized in this how every action that one takes is like a stone cast in the water. And if it's loving, that stone, you know, is cast in the water and the loving action goes out and touches the first person that it's intended for. And then it touches another person and then it touches another person because that person interacts with other people and so on and so on. And every action has a reverberating effect upon every single one of us on the face of this planet. So if I had committed a loving action, it was like love upon love upon light. A, lo a loving, a purely loving action was the most wonderful thing that I could ever achieved in my life. This had more meaning than to have been a Rockefeller or president of the United States or to have been you know, a, a great scientist and to have invented something just incredible. If I had committed a truly pure and loving action, it had reverberated throughout the stuff of every individual on that planet. And I felt their, that action reverberating through them and through myself. And I felt it in a way that uh, is beyond what we can even feel ourselves on this plane of existence. And I was given the opportunity to deal with my life, or better still, I had to address issues involving my life and interestingly, all the things I was focused on in my life. I was an entrepreneur and I had created a very successful enterprise in which I had invested a lot of time and energy. I also defined myself by how successful this enterprise had become and how young I was when I had founded it, how many jobs I had generated, how valuable this enterprise was and so on. But amazingly enough, 
All these things were entirely irrelevant in the light of these last few minutes before my possible death. But the questions I asked myself at that time were, how did I lead my life? What kind of employer was I? And what kind of colleague? What kind of father was I for my three children? How was my conduct toward my siblings and my friends and my parents and so on? It doesn't matter how successful you've been, how much money you've made, how many kids you've had, you know, what kind of a name you've made for yourself. What matters is, did I touch people? Did I allow them to touch me? Was I living a life of emotional well-being? You know, was I celebrating myself? Was I proud of me? You know, none of us get enough kudos in life. From our parents, none of us got loved the way we wanted to be loved. And that's the way it was set up. But we have the ability to love ourselves and make up the difference. And that's part of what our job is, you know, to be the highest vision of ourselves that we can be. No one wants to look forward to death, but you can look forward to what's on the other side. It is such a beautiful feeling. I feel that we have such an amazing experience awaiting us and that we don't end. Our consciousness continues on. So even though we shed that you know, wetsuit of a body, you have a beautiful outcome awaiting you after the point of death. So don't fear it. Look forward to it. Change your life to also include a lot of love and a lot of helping others and focusing on good things because those people who've had a near-death experience and gone beyond mine that had a life review often report that they feel what the other person felt when they were dealing with people throughout their life. So I think that all of us should kind of aim towards a good life review. So do good things. Go out there and have a happy life. Enjoy it. Enjoy every day and find ways to be happy because uh, that's what we're here for. That's what our experience is for. And there is no judgment. I'm going to move from this and I'll tell you when we pass from this life, we're going to be embraced by loving arms and simply asked, what did you learn? Tell me about what you learned in your experience. What was it like to be like that? What was it like to be you? What was it like to have this or not have that? Or, and, and it's all going to be a collective oneness of, wow, look what we learned. Look what we created. Look at the uniqueness. There's no time or, or energy for how do I assist others? How do I make a difference in the world? I, 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 I found a key for me, and it's if I can take only 10 minutes a day, I mean, I'd rather take an hour, but even 10 minutes to be still, to be still and just reconnect, like always be connected. Just remember, remember that connection. Remember who I am. Remember that everything's in divine order and, and let go of the fear, let go of the contention, let go of that doubt that there's not enough. You know, we, we live in such fear that there's not enough. There's not enough money. There's not enough food. There's not enough time. There's not enough love. And yet if we can let go of that and realize there is enough. And I think the key for me was realizing that I'm enough. I'm enough. I mean, I, I limp around on one leg and I do the best I can, but I am enough by simply being me, by simply showing up in light, in love, and loving the people around me and taking care of those around me. And when I say taking care of, just energetically, you know. Es kann nicht schief gehen. Es, also, das, wenn ich, wenn ich das, diesen ganzen, diesen ganzen Wust und es sind 20 Jahre des Nachdenkens und Verarbeitens, wenn ich den in einem Satz zusammenfassen kann, dieser Satz trägt, andere Sätze kommen mir später dann ein bisschen komisch vor, es kann nicht schief gehen. Und was ist es? Dein Leben. Natürlich weiß ich, Mensch, ich habe mit ganz vielen tragischen Fällen zu tun in meinem Beruf, dass es oft furchtbar schief geht, dass Dinge einfach nicht zu beantworten sind, dass man sich fragt, wo bleibt da Gott? Es kann da gar keinen Gott geben. Ähm, Gott als Person denken, es ist alles ganz, ganz schwierig. Unter dem Strich bleibt, es kann nicht schief gehen. It's cool. It's, I'm, we're all here to learn. We're all here to do better and be better how you treat others and stuff. Oh, and there's no religion. That's the other thing. If you go there, there's no religion. Uh-uh. 
There's no priest, there's no rabbi, there's no bishop, there's nothing. It does not matter. <laughs> nothing. Uh-uh. So when I hear someone say, well, you're going to hell because you're not this and this. I'm like, trust me. You're in such a surprise when you get there. Because it's so not relevant. It's just not relevant. What is the true religion? What is the religion here in heaven? So that in heaven, there is no religion. When you come to heaven, what you're going to find here is love. Love is the most powerful force in the universe. And that's what is going to unite the whole humanity again. And it was such an intense experience because it was as though um, many of you have had the experience of having a, a little baby and just pouring your love into that baby and everything you are and all of your hopes and dreams and everything you are. And in this situation, I was that baby and Christ was just filling me, pouring his love into me. And it was uh, remarkable. Die Schau oder dieses Erlebnis zeigt mir, dass es alles viel, viel größer, viel, viel weiter, viel, viel universeller und uns alle angehend ist. Und es hat wahrscheinlich ganz wenig, kann ich das jetzt sagen, ich will jetzt aber nicht zu vorsichtig sein, ich sage das jetzt einfach mal. Der Glaube ist eine Krücke für hier. Die hilft mir gehen. Das ist für mich mein christlicher Glaube. Ob das katholisch oder evangelisch ist, das ist, also ich glaube, da gibt es so viele Gemeinsamkeiten und so wenige wirkliche Unterschiede. Das äh, hat für mich nie eine große Rolle gespielt. Aber dass der Glaube eben auch nur eine Gehhilfe ist und dass ich diese Gehhilfe dann gar nicht mehr brauche, diese Krücke, äh, das äh, verbinde ich mit dieser Erfahrung. All of the events of my life unfold. And it was incredible. The great decisions that I had made, the contributions that I had made, um, the little small things that I'd done to make somebody's day, and then there were the things where I hadn't used great judgment. And the one thing that really sticks out that just tickles me and shows me that the universe has this incredible sense of humor is they were these cringeworthy moments. Absolutely, where you knew what was coming. And if I have to tell you that there was any kind of experience or any kind of negative aspect of the experience, that was it. And it's not even negative. It's that kind of, oh, I see what's coming up and I know what I did there. And you're looking around. Well, who's judging this? That, you know, I was taught my whole life that somebody was going to be judging. So, you know, and I'm looking and I'm looking and it's still just me and my cheerleaders, my guardians. And I'm like, wait a minute, this isn't how I was taught this work. So I'm looking, there's no judge, and I'm realizing, oh, wait a minute, I'm judging this. Oh, well, I'm going to be really kind to myself here. <laughs> and I'm seeing these experiences take place, and I'm, the feeling that I'm having is one of empathy for me in the decisions that I made with the tools that I had at the time. And for the other person who's experiencing my, my lack of judgment at the time or what we might consider hurtful behaviors. And I'm watching and I'm kind of very detached and I'm going, okay, well, if I were doing that again, I might do it this way. And I'm thinking and I'm integrating those thoughts. And that was it. There was no wrath. There was no judgment, just this peaceful, loving space of everything's okay. But I, I can tell you one thing for sure. There was no judgment there was n there was no atonement there was nothing that i had ever done that was completely forgiven and forgiven in that context meant it was gone it did not exist you know the stupid little bone-headed things I've done in my life that were, have been, you know, well, let's just say less than <laughs> wonderful. Um, I didn't have to atone for that. God wasn't holding me accountable for that. God was loving me right through it. And it was total and complete forgiveness. It was not as I had been taught that I would, uh, 
I would be judged and I would either be led into heaven or I would be banished to hell or to suffer some some place that was outside of heaven. That is, that just, to me, and I don't mean this against anyone else, but that just seems crazy. It makes no sense to me with respect to what I saw. I stood before a, a being of light that was nothing but unconditional love, that loved me and wanted the best for me. And what I viewed in my life review, watching watching that movie of my life in front of this being, th th it was not a pretty sight. You know, I was full of anger. I was resentful. I I felt hatred towards God. I denied there was a God because there couldn't be a God that would make the world the way that it was. Just because I had some some kind of negative experiences that had happened in my life and through my teenage years. I was very angry at the time, but yet this being of light did nothing but love me. And I was given information in a way that wasn't words, but I was given understandings of things. And the one thing that was very, very clear to me was that our emotions create energy that goes out and affects other people. And what we have to do is get rid of that, uh, you know, transform that, that negative energy that really comes into the category of either fear, if, if it's hatred, anger, any of those things, it, it's fear energy as opposed to love energy. I have to, I had to change, get, you know, transform that kind of energy into love and be able to hold that energy of love and project that out into the universe. I, I saw how I was affecting other people with my emotions. The God force power that I felt was totally forgiving of any of any so-called error there in my wildest dreams I can't conceive of God being interested in punishing God is interested in bringing us to him to love punishment just isn't God's game God as hard as it is to accept, we'll, there's nothing, as I said, there's nothing that we can do that would make God love us less. And that, that sounds hard because people have done some pretty bad things throughout history. Um, it really comes down to judging ourselves and being able to forgive ourselves. Once we understand the, 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 the gravity of what we've done when our time comes, we're supposed to be afraid of God. Mm -hmm. Not a single person has had an MDE, not unless their, their opinion is biased by their religious beliefs. Not a single person has said, I'm sure you've seen this yourself, will tell you that God hates you or God doesn't love you. Like, you never hear that. It was also shown simultaneously that it wasn't my fault that I caused pain. That's a natural outgrowth of being a human being in this world. It's just the way it is. And every human being causes pain to other human beings and to themselves. And that's just the way it is. And that's a known thing by the divine. God knows this about us. And and once they were gone, I was infilled with this combination of truth, joy, knowledge, bliss, understanding, compassion, hope, um, adoration, awe, paradise. Uh, the list is long, but it wasn't, they weren't all separate things. Uh, they're all one thing. And, uh, and the one word that I would use to encapsulate it all, two words, beauty and love. It was the most perfect peace any human could even imagine multiplied by a billion, and that's not enough. As a writer, I've always been anxious, nervous, neurotic, concerned, overthinking everything, and I have not known a lot of peace. And in this experience, I realized I th always wondered what I would look like if you took away all those fears and worries and woes and anxieties, and I thought, this is it. This is wonderful, but what you're seeing are tiny droplets of light and they're surrounding you and blessing you and healing you. And they said, regardless of whether you go to heaven or whether you return to earth, you're here for healing because you have been in so much pain and this is how we heal. And if you decided to go on to heaven, you would still need to be healed. Everyone 
who goes into heaven, they can't go with a disease process imprinted on their consciousness or thinking that some mental illness is part of their identity. So we all pass through the white room for healing, as my friend said, and I thought it was a beautiful uh, analogy. She said, leave your muddy boots at the door. <laughs> and I felt bad for things that I felt I could have done better, but all of the spiritual people who were there only radiated love and understanding to me and no sense of judgment, whatever. The main reason I didn't feel worthy before was because as a child and praying for my father to live, that I hadn't felt that my prayer had been worthy enough or I had been worthy enough for God to grant that to me. And so therefore, I thought I have to learn how to become more and more and more worthy. Whereas what I found when I was there was that I already was worthy enough. And not only was I, but so was my father and my brother and my other relatives who I knew very well had not been born again Christians, had not had baptisms in the Holy Spirit. We live in fear. We're so conditioned with judgment or religion or, 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 or even our parents or whoever said, well, you're a bad boy. You don't deserve that. That's not coming. Well, you've got to earn that. You know, I mean, all, all these things that we have conditioned in our mind when in reality, we're, we, we are deserving. We, we are worthy. Always. We're of great worth. So lots of questions having to do with worthiness completely were evaporated by my experience because I wasn't judged in any way. I was made to feel completely and totally loved and accepted as I was and realized that that's true of everyone. I felt so much love and I said, well, let me get perfect. I don't deserve to see, I don't deserve to be in your presence right now. Let me go back and live, get perfect and come back. He's saying, no, I love you how you are now. We're never alone. God cares deeply about us and loves us more than we can imagine. Others also do. Maybe loved ones of ours that are no longer in this life, their love is still there and is still very strong. The important thing is for people to learn somehow how to regularly tune into that love that is always there. And that's, again, where I mentioned prayer and also meditation. And I had no idea that I was that loved. And I know it's the same for each and every one of you. That's the unconditional love that was flooding through me. Just, uh, and if the light, of, I know this, that God was a being of light pure consciousness. I don't know how to explain it all. I was just there trying to understand the power of everything that was going on. Um, but if a being of light could do backflips with extreme joy and saying, wahoo, yes, he's home, let's have a party, that God was thrilled to see me again. Absolutely mind-bogglingly thrilled that I was there again. And it's going to be the same way for you when you go home. Speaking of home, I knew knew I was home. There was this energetic information of feeling like I was home. Like I had never had anywhere here or ever will. I was my source of origin, my point of, of creation. I knew I was in the presence of my creator. I knew I'm far more special than I had. I had no idea that and we're all that way. It's the same for everybody. And with that thought, I hope I can be forgiven. There was this download of information, of peace, of love. The first thing that was communicated is there's nothing to forgive. Everything is in perfect divine order. And then I had what I've learned is called the life review. I began to see my life. You know, I saw my parents divorce and what that did to me. It made me so insecure and my self doubt and my not enoughness and i saw my brothers and the role they played in my life as my best friends and my heroes and 
I saw things, even when I'd say, oh, that, that was a mistake. I didn't mean to do that. And this beautiful being that held me said, there are no mistakes. What did you learn? And this beautiful being that held me said, that's your judgment of it, not ours. What have you become because of it, not in spite of it? And there was all this love. There was so much unconditional love in these arms and no judgment only beauty and peace and insight, like deep wisdom. And I was told by this divine presence, this being who held me that even felt physical the way I was held, I was told, you can be mad at God your whole life, and that would be okay. They would love me anyway. Or I was told I could be mad at myself my whole life, and that would be okay. They would love me anyway. It was nothing but love. But I was also given a third choice, and this was interesting because the being who held me, who I call God, said, I want you to have your will in this circumstance. And I'm like, my will? I was brought up in a conservative Christian home. It's your will be done, not my will be done. And this being communicated to me, God said, your will is my will. That's how much we love you. My will has always been that you have free will and I want you to make a choice. And it was communicated to me that I could give my son back, that I could exercise my will and hand him over to God and release him and trust and let go, rather than harboring all that anger and guilt and turmoil within me. And in all that peace and in all that love and in all that beauty and all that insight and wisdom, I was able to kiss my little boy and I handed him back. I gave him over. I handed him over to God and I let go. Me, I mean, I, I had grown up believing that life was a test. And yet in all that love and in all that beauty, I realized that life is not a test. It was a gift. I was told life is a gift. And in every moment, I have a choice of what I choose to do or how I choose to react. Even the emotions, if something makes me angry, what a gift that I can feel an emotion. I did this. Oh, shit. Then I said, oh, I just swore in front of God. And look at this guy, go, oh shit, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm slick. When you go back, you will tell people how important choice is in their lives. And here's what choice means. It doesn't mean what am I gonna have for dinner. It means every moment of your life, you are making choices in your thinking. How you think about people, how you think about the story, Someone tells you something that goes against your belief system, and you go, well, I, don't, I don't really believe that, even if you don't say it. That's a choice, and how precious choice is to human beings. You know, we talk about free will, but this was like more than that. This is like every moment of choice. A lot of times people think if they're sitting in a coffee shop or something, and they're, they look over and they see someone, and they have thoughts about that. Oh, look at that person, their coat doesn't match their shoes, or whatever it is you're thinking. You think just because you don't say it that it doesn't have an impact, but that's not true. There's an energy associated with that. Um, I don't, and I don't know how to explain that. Energy looks so different to me now. I thought that life was happening to me. I thought that everything that was going wrong or not going right was because of... God was doing it to me. Life was doing it to me. I hadn't a clue that I had any power in all of that. I didn't know that we are an extension of God. I grew up believing and being taught that we are created in the image and likeness of God. Well, I'm here to tell you it's a hell of a lot bigger than that. We are an extension of the God source here on earth. We were created so that the creator could experience everything that we experience. We were created out of love. And the creator's always got our back. Spirit's always got our back. And all is well, no matter what it looks like, all is well. So we do our best, and sometimes we don't do so well. 
some of those things in the 60s especially. <laughs> but there's no judgment. There's none whatsoever. They were all, my relatives were all just happy to see me. They were so proud of me. And I'm like, well, I haven't done anything. They were proud of me. Just, <coughs> just getting up every single morning and trying again. Especially on the days when it's been bad. They were so proud of me. What courage it took to do that. What courage it took to be on planet Earth, pretending to be human, pretending to be separate, willingly muffling our connection to all that is, pretending that we're flawed and limited. What courage that takes. They were amazing. And, and I'm standing there like, well, I've never done anything important. They said, oh, you've done the most important thing that exists. You know, I've encountered nothing, nothing but beauty, love that I didn't even know existed, everything since I crossed over to this place has been perfect and beautiful and totally loving. What about my sins? And he said to me, there are no sins, not the way you think of them on earth. He said, the only thing that matters here is what you think. And he asked me a question. He said, what is in your heart? I saw what the core of me was, and it was love. It was perfect love. It was the same thing that I had been immersed in with the light. That was the core of me. And I knew it wasn't just the core of me. It was the core of human beings. It was the way in which we are created in the image of God. That's the part. We are that, that piece of God ourselves. That is who we really are. And I remember thinking, oh, of course, of course. I used to know that. How did I ever forget that? Und dann hat sich dann äh, noch eine höhere Ebene aufgetan. Und die war wunderschön. Es war so, als wie diese Ebene sich geöffnet hat, äh, dass ich hinter die Kulissen des Lebens schauen konnte. Es waren plötzlich Dinge klar, die ein Mensch so gar nicht verstehen kann. Und es wurde mir auch gegeben, dieses Wissen. Ich wurde geschult in diesem Wissen. Und die Kernaussage war, dass ich immer beschützt bin, dass alles, die gesamte Realität, wie wir sie wahrnehmen, nur ein Teil eines größeren Ganzen ist, dass es nicht einmal so real ist, wie ich glaube, dass ich keine Angst haben brauche, in meinem ganzen Leben nicht, weil mir nichts passieren kann, dass das ganze Universum miteinander verwoben ist, dass ich jeder Gedanke zählt, den man hat, jeder einzelne Gedanke, und dass alles Liebe ist und dass ich immer beschützt bin, dass ich keine Angst haben brauche. Das wurde immer so wiederholt. Es wurde wiederholt. Und während dieser Ebene, während die offen war, war ein Gefühl einer unendlichen Liebe, die ausgestrahlt hat von, diesem, von dieser Ebene, die mich so ergriffen hat. Ich konnte nicht wirklich antworten, weil ich war so orientierungslos, aber ich war so ergriffen und so, ich habe mich so wohl gefühlt und so beschützt und so geliebt. Ich war richtig ähm, berührt. I think most people carry around a lot of shame. And that was, that was cured in one fell swoop. The shame was gone. I knew I was innocent. The other thing I knew was that I was, that life was completely safe. My life on earth and here and in this other realm was always safe. There was nothing, nothing to be afraid of ever. I also saw that, um, it was all perfect. It was all for love and it was all perfect. Even when I couldn't see it in the state I was in, in my NDE, I could see why I could see, I could see it all come together. Like, ah, oh, like seeing the big picture of things like, oh my God, it's all I'm and it, and it inspired within me feelings of absolutely 
indescribable gratitude for my life. Life was beautiful from that perspective. It was so meaningful and so rich with experience and love and connection and beauty and all of that and, and more. <clears throat> uh, don't waste your life thinking you're not loved. And when he said the word your life, I felt, I felt this, it was palpable how precious my life was and not just how precious my life was, but how precious everybody's life was, including that kid in Africa. And, and as we're reviewing a specific instance, let's say it was one in which I got really, really angry and, and upset because something that happened to somebody did something to me that really, really made me angry. And, and, and the life would say to me, well, look at, wasn't that Andy, wasn't that really a waste of energy? You were so angry for something that in the long run doesn't make any difference because in the long run, both you and the person that you're really angry with are going to be in the light anyway. You're just experiencing something that both of you chose to experience. Wow. So as we, as we view all those things, we, we started to laugh at how serious I was taking life. Now, come on, Andy, yeah. really now. In life, everything that happens to us, there's a gift in it, even if we can't imagine what it could be. You've heard many people who've had cancer talk about what a gift it was for them because they learned about loving themselves. They learned about opening their hearts and allowing people to do for them. They learned to receive. The thing about life, what I learned is that everything about life is a gift, even the challenges. We're here to experience life. So we're here to even experience the challenges. When I had cancer, I never would have thought that was a gift. I suffered a lot, terribly, and if anybody told me that was a gift, I would have thought it was absolute nonsense because I was suffering so much. But today, I know that was the biggest gift that life could ever have given me. Everything in life is a gift in the end. And if it doesn't feel like a gift right now, it means you haven't reached the end yet. <laughs> it became very clear to me that suffering in this life can very much be a gift. Not necessarily a gift, it's a catalyst, and a catalyst is, is neutral. But uh, uh, suffering gives us the opportunity to grow spiritually. And if our true reality is spiritual and not physical, uh, and, and if our physical suffering results in the development of our spiritual being and spiritual qualities, then it can indeed be a gift. Because if you think about it, there's no moment that we can be courageous without the existence of pain and danger. There's no way that we can truly show compassion in this realm of existence unless, uh, unfortunately, someone else may be suffering. There's no way that we can truly have patience, that spiritual quality of patience, and endure, unless things are not going according to how we may desire. And so, uh, if as a result of our physical suffering, we can develop these eternal, these essential, these everlasting, these, these non-ephemeral uh, qualities that are going to last beyond our mere 70 years of life, you know, into, into the next realm, then we are creating our own spiritual being that we're going to take with us. And that is the most glorious of uh, achievements uh, that we can possibly have. So suffering uh, from that perspective gives us uh, the opportunity uh, to exhibit spiritual quality. You know, it's easy to give lip service to uh, trusting, and yes, I'm listening to where God's leading, but it's very different, and it's a very different thing to say, yes, 
I find that most of us are much happier to say no. <laughs> because God leads us places where we may not want to go or don't think that we can't go. I mean, rarely is it within our comfort zone. You know, God doesn't usually say, hey, you know what? You're doing great. You're so happy in what you're doing. Keep doing it. Because none of us grow or change or learn anything when we're in the status quo. We learn, we grow, we change, we develop when we're stressed in whatever way. We're given all sorts of challenges. Do you have any idea why you experienced the abuse that you did? Why did you experience that in this lifetime? Well, I don't, I'm not sure. It was something obviously between me and my mother. And the only way I see any meaning out of it now is that I've become a psychotherapist and I work with people that were traumatized, abused, and neglected as children. And I understand their path because I've walked in the same shoes. Mm -hmm. So for me, the curse has become the gift because I'm using my experiences and my healing to help other people heal. With this understanding in this place that, that the body is, in a way, there, as hard as it is to see and understand, that true learning happens within the body because when we are in experience in this form, there's something that evolves within us, that can evolve within us um, at soul level that makes the body an important part of the whole, that it, you know, that it isn't one's good and one's bad, but that the two work together in an important way. So that was very healing for me personally to come to a better understanding the sense of love was such that nothing else was needed. And that was the teaching I got from the very beginning, everything is going to be okay. And although I couldn't understand that many times, how this can be okay, that was always the teaching. Everything is happening for a reason and everything is following a path of perfection. We just don't know this because we're just living and understanding a very little piece of the picture. We don't know what anything is for. And later in my life, I learned that the purpose of this was the beings of light wanted to show me that home was not a place. Home was a state of being. Home, heaven is here and now. And what I knew within that block of knowledge was that the world is perfect. And when I say world, I mean the totality, the allness, the everything. It, it's perfect. And I remember distinctly the very words that did come in, and it was that the world operates according to a perfect plan, and the plan is working itself out in its perfection. And I knew that that was true. I knew that all of this was true. And, and, I, and I lived with, with this feeling for a while, knowing that all the things that we think are cruel and horrible and, and all the wars that are going on, knowing that somehow this is part of the perfect plan. It's part of what God is working out and that I didn't personally have to worry about it. Although back on earth you want to do something about it and that's because we live here on earth for the moment. But in reality I didn't have to worry about a thing. It was all planned out and perfect. What is, your, uh, what is your mission? What, is, what were you told your mission I don't is? know. Uh, we all have missions. Uh, we're all not to know what they are because uh, I was told that if I knew what my mission was, I would hurry up, rush out, and complete it to get so back. that I could get back. Everything that we think about as hard to understand or unfair or uh, cruel, brutal, whatever, that that was all really without meaning. Um, and I know that's very difficult, but 
I knew this. I understood it. I comprehended it in a way that when I came back from the experience, I really couldn't comprehend anymore. But I understood that all of the things that we worry about and that concern us, we don't have to worry about at all. There is a perfect plan, and the plan is working itself out in its perfection. I ask many questions. For instance, uh, you know, why are we here? And I was told pretty much we, we banged on the door for this life. Our souls, it sounds so philosophical, but we, we, our souls, or whatever you want to call it, insisted on being born. And that it was a, it was a, something we really wanted a lot. Well, we're the heavyweights of heaven down here on earth. You know, we're going through this. We are so loved. That, that's all there is. We are so loved. The judgment and punishment are things that humans do. We judge ourselves. We judge each other. We punish ourselves. We punish each other. God doesn't do that. God just loves us no matter what we do. God knows how hard it is here. <laughs> God admires us for being willing to come here and give it a go. <laughs> we have so much tremendous support, we just can't see it. But if you tune in, you can feel all the love around you all the time. Remember to ask for help because it is always there. It is always there. But you have to ask because they're not going to interfere with us because we have free will. So it's all about love. And sometimes it's really hard to be loving in the world that we've created. But every little bit that we can try to do, every little bit of trying to create heaven on earth is so important and has such a ripple effect. We are all magnificent, divine, powerful creators, and we need to step into that and recognize it and be love. It didn't have to be this hard. And I was like, wow, that just like, because that's how I operated, you know, I was this do it all by myself. And, and the theme of my conversations with these beings was very much around the fact that it's always about a choice. If it's not working, choose different. You don't ever have to be afraid and ask for help and support. For me, that was huge because I don't do that well. And they even said, ask us for help and support. You don't even ask us. That's the, you know, and they weren't saying it in a judgmental way, but it was a very loving way about ask for help and support. We're here. I heard a voice behind me that said, ask for help. And I was like, what? So I look everywhere. I didn't see anyone. Right. And then I heard a little later, ask for help. And I was like, are you kidding me? I'm being here for over 30 minutes. I'm dying here. Could you help me at least? Nothing. Just the wind and the water. And then I heard for the third time, I told you to ask for help. And I was like, oh my God, okay, okay, okay. In my mind, there was no way in a million years that I'm going to get out of there because the island was so far away. So because this voice was behind me, pushing me, I was like, okay, okay. So I started waving and saying, help, 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 help. At the end of the island, one of my friends that was in my group came out of the group because he felt something was wrong. He went to the top of a hill and he saw me from the top of the hill. And then he started screaming, Carlos, I'm going to call 911. Hold on, hold on, hold on. And after 10 minutes, this guy's trying to get me, but the ocean is still sucking me in. Everybody give up and everybody starts turning around. And as soon as I see everybody turning around, I said, you know what, God, I don't want to fight anymore. If this is it for me, I'm just going to surrender and do whatever you want. And in this moment, when I, I say surrender, I tell people how many times in your life you're fighting with cancer, you're fighting with your, your mom, your dad, your sons, with school, with work, with anything in your life. The only thing you have to do is surrender and let God 
take over, you know? And that's what I did in that moment. I just surrendered. And in that moment, a huge wave came and crushed me all the way under the ocean. So when I was under the ocean, I opened my eyes and I see a big shadow that's coming my way. And as soon as I see the shadow, I thought it was a shark. So I covered my face just to wait for the bite. But this thing grabbed me from the bottom of my stomach and pushed me all the way up to get air. So when I get to the top, guess what it was? It was a huge dolphin. So I grabbed the dolphin by the tail and I start crying because I couldn't believe that the dolphin saved my life. So I'm there with the dolphin. The dolphin is not moving left or right. He's just standing right there. After 10 minutes, a feature boat show up in front of me. It can be comforting to be a, a victim. Absolutely. That Absolutely. That's a case as well, too. It, when we do choose to be responsible for our life, however, that's a scary thing as well, too, because there isn't an outside force we can blame it on. I had someone say to me just yesterday, I really feel like God is testing me. And I said to them, how about if you were just testing yourself? What if you knew that these experiences were coming and you would find the strength in yourself to overcome it? And it really just shifted the entire way that he looked at the situation. It was a big aha moment for him. We all come here with a calling, with a higher calling, all of us. And we can say that is our destiny, but we have the free will as to whether to follow our higher calling or not. There's always the free will as to whether we follow. So our destiny is actually the intention we came here with, the calling, the purpose, but we don't always have to follow it. So how do we reach our higher calling? How do we attain what we came here to achieve? We do that always by just being authentic, being who we are. We do that about being fearless about being who we are instead of always trying to please other people. Our fear of disappointing other people is what takes us away from our higher calling. It's also what takes us away from why we came here. So our destiny is not set in stone. Our destiny is really our highest potential. We came here with the intention of achieving our highest potential. So if we really want to achieve our high, highest potential, our only work is to shine our light as bright as we can. Our only work is to find love. It's to feed ourselves love and to be love because the more love we feel, the more love we share, the more we're moving away from fear. We have the free will to go in the direction of fear. We have the free will to make ourselves small and dim our lights. And so this is where free will comes in. Do we follow our destiny or do we follow our lower self and follow fear? That's always our choice. So what help do we have? Uh, I learned that we all have guardian angels. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I had eight. Now I eight? thought eight. <laughs> and uh, I thought, um, am I a particularly tough case? And, um, and no, I am not. Uh, we all have many guardian angels that are around us, and not constantly uh, they're imposing, but um, you may have two or three at one time, and during your deeper, uh, darkest hours, you may have eight or more. And uh, they, can, they do not uh, interfere with your free will, but uh, they try to encourage you to do the right things and always leading you uh, to and directing you towards the, the right things in your path. I kept asking the beings of life, why me? Why this is happening to me? And it's when they answered to me, in 20 years you will understand. What? 20 years? Imagine, and even at that age, 20 years is like a forever and a day. And they say someday you will pass these teachings to others. No. At that moment of my life, I was not interested. I want to become a scientist. I'm not interested. I'm not teaching this to anyone. I asked the beings of light just to give me a break, pretty much. I wanted to be like everyone else. And this is the compassion of the universe. We're not forced. I mean, at that moment, it was like, okay. You're not going to see us, 
or hear us for a while. When you are ready, it will happen. There's a point in your life that life shakes you so hard that you only have two choices. There's only two paths. The path of suffering or the path of the light. The path of suffering is, is like a cul-de-sac. You go to the end of this and there's nowhere to go. Or it's like when you're in a car and you turn it on, you press the gas, but you never put the drive, put the car in drive, you don't go anywhere. You're spending all your gas. You're spending all your energy. You're circling there. Nothing is happening until you realize I had enough of this. Some people have to get sick. Somebody has to die. You, you feel that you're going to just kill yourself. Whatever it is, it brings you and shakes you so hard that you are forced to stop. And it's when you ask the question, what is this for? What am I doing here? Now the important questions start coming. And it's when the answers also start appearing. It's when you say, at that point when sometimes I, I am just so trapped in things I don't understand. I said, God help me see because I cannot see. But I know that behind this challenge, there is a teaching, there is a purpose. And the very next day I got, I woke up with the answer I needed. And I said to people, sometimes it are the most simple answers. The answer was, yeah, you need help. Go look for a psychologist. I said, yeah. And I had it clear. It was not just a thought, oh, I may do it. No, it was clear. I went this morning to my office. I looked for a psychologist. I phoned a guy in the web and it was the right person. So I went to talk to him and it's when we realize that sometimes what we truly need is just to be listened. And this person was opening to listen. This guy is not judging me. And that was the opening for me. I was the one that said to him, why me again? This question that always was resurfing. Resurfing and like, why me? Why this is happening to me? And it's when I got the most amazing answer. And he said, why not? <gasps> what? For me, this was like the switch I needed at that moment. The light had turned off, was on now. Because at that moment, he started to also say, look, Thanks to this, you have done this. Thanks to this, you have done that. Thanks to this and this. And, and I was able to connect all the knots. And now it's like all my neurons, everything was like accelerating and everything was connecting. And this was the first time in my life I put myself at the cause of everything and not at the effect. And I started to see purpose in absolutely everything. At that moment, I also realized that none of that had happened was here anymore. It was in my mind and I could decide what to do with it. Wow, I can grab all this and just make a decision to start fresh. The true feelings of, of, of sense of forgiveness happened. It was the realization that there was nothing to forgive because nothing had ever been done to me to hurt me. It's been done for me to bring me to wake up. But to realize that God loves each and every one of us more intensely than we have any ability to understand or comprehend and has a plan for each one of us I mean, that's incredible. I was told about some of the things I still had to do on Earth. And at that time, we had the first of a uh, couple of conversations about uh, some of those things, including the, the future death of my oldest son. And at that time, in the conversation, part of it, of course, was, well, what's that about? <laughs> you know, why? And again, it went back to this life review that I had. And recognizing that mine and ours 
Our position is not to ask why. Our responsibility is not to know the answer and to make that judgment of whether something is worth it or not. But our responsibility is to trust and to say, yes, God's will be done. And trust that there is beauty that will come of all things. And that there is hope in the plan for each person's if indeed I trust that there is a plan for each person's life that's one of hope, then the same would be true of my son's life. And I woke up every day knowing that, first of all, the plan could change. And certainly I hoped each day that the plan would change. But I also woke up each day knowing that if the plan for his life did not change, that there would be incredible hope and beauty that came not only out of my son's life, but out of his death. In addition to which, if you truly believe that there is life after death, then it changes your experience of death. Because, you know, we have work to do here, but our time here is this incredible opportunity that's so short. And then we transition on, and death is not the final word because it was the most remarkable thing. We did go through my life, and we looked at events in my life that in any other situation, I would have described as uh, sad or bad or challenging or horrible, all sorts of words like that. Recognizing that those are judgments that I've put on them. <coughs> And then I had the most incredible experience of seeing the impact of a given event, not two or three or four times removed, which we can all understand. You know, you have a bad day at work, you go home, you yell at your husband, and then they're mean to the kid, and the kid, you know, is mean to the dog, that whole sequence. We can certainly understand the impact within our own little world of events. And in fact, when we look at events that occur elsewhere. We similarly really evaluate those events based on how it impacts us, our world, our view of the world, our emotional state. But I had this incredible privilege of seeing how an event impacted other people in the world 25, 30, 35 times removed. And to say it was profound really is, uh, not giving it its due credit because what it showed me very clearly and very concretely is that again this idea that things are good or bad are the idea is entirely in our own mind it's our, our own judgment because the fact is there really is beauty that comes out of every event albeit Usually, we can only appreciate it retrospectively. And most of the time, we'll never appreciate it. Because we don't have the ability to see those 25, 30, 35 times removed impacts. And part of our evaluation of something when it comes to being good or bad really has to do with a desire to judge it. And a desire to say, well, was that worth it? because we want to decide whether something that has hurt us or made us sad or someone we love uh, has, has gone on, we want to be able to say, well, I don't think that was worth it. Or, okay, now I get it. Oh, okay, I'm okay with it then. But having the ability to see events in my own life and see their impact totally changed the way I experience every event. You asked Jesus why there is pain in the world. What answer did you get? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I learned that there's pain in the world because it is part of our the natural growth process that uh, if we didn't learn pain, we would not learn joy or happiness. And um, so some of us that have probably the greater pain are actually the greater spirits capable of handling um, that additional uh, growth 
uh, period. Does that go for horribly innocent suffering like the Holocaust would come to mind? Uh, yes, people it does. just victimized in pain? Yes, it does. And I know that that is very difficult to understand on the, at the earthly level. But if you uh, could understand it from the spiritual sense, in that uh, the spirit is so much stronger. What about people who inflict pain? Are there negative spirits as well as positive ones, angels? Um, most of the, when you talk about the people that inflict pain, uh, that is basically could be any one of us here in this room. And um, I learned that these people are just giving back what they have received in life. Um, often it is um, even actually uh, genetically coded uh, some of the um, trends, I guess, that run through families. We, we wanted to come and have the experience because our soul would expand. And while we're here, we just think, oh my gosh, I can't do this. I mean, this is too hard. But our higher self, our higher knowledge thinks, yeah, but that's why you came. I mean, it's, it's easy for me to sit in a beautiful house and say life is good. And there's people that suffer struggling. I mean, I'm working with some folks that work with human trafficking. I mean, kids being taken and put into the sex trade or whatever else. It, there are things in the world that are heart-wrenching. And so how do we look at those and say, it's all in divine order? How does this make sense? I embrace it as a perfect opportunity to be love. How can I shine light in dark places? How can I embrace things and, and make a difference? And I realize I'm just one. I'm just one guy, but Gosh, can I make life better for somebody today? Can I do something for someone? And by doing it for the one, you're doing it for the all. Even when I raise my own vibration, if I can go meditate for a minute and get at peace or forgive, you know, something, even if it's forgiving myself, I forgive others very easily. The hard one to forgive for me is myself. That ripples out. It ripples out and affects the consciousness of all of humanity. But it comes down to choice. Allow me to again uh, remember everything that had been told to me and recall the entire process and all the discussions about trust because what it really required was trust and what it really required uh, later on was the trust to say here here is my son. He's your son. Uh, and I will tell you that it is that transformation that, that motivates me to talk to people. Because I believe that that is truly the absolute key to living a life filled with joy no matter what the circumstances. You know, happiness is like love. It's an emotion. Sometimes you're really happy, sometimes you're sad. You know, sometimes I really love my husband and sometimes I want to kill him. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's, a, it's an emotion and emotions are based on circumstance. But joy is a very different thing. And I believe it's that transformation from hope or faith that the promises of God are true to an absolute trust that they're true that changes everything. And trust, I believe, is a choice. It is a decision. Hope and faith, it's not really, I don't really think that's a choice. I mean, you kind of, you hear my story, you hear other people's stories, and you kind of hope it's true. I mean, maybe in Maybe you go through life and you sort of see things happen and you have faith that, yeah, okay, I'm pretty sure it's true. But then something happens and your faith is shaken because you're saying, well, why? <clears throat> why did my brother-in-law die as a young man? And so then you say, well, I'm pretty angry. I'm like, why did that happen? But when your faith is shaken, I would say that it's because you've never uh, made that transformation. You know, we're all going to die, obviously, and we are all going to suffer loss. We are all going to suffer challenge. 
And while I don't ask for more challenges, I mean, I don't, I don't want more. Uh, and I always hate to say this out loud, but I kind of embrace challenges because I am grateful for those challenges because I am grateful for the way those challenges are changing me and deepening whatever aspect is important at that time, whether it's uh, humility, compassion, and on down the list. And I can be grateful because of that trust. And I absolutely believe that everyone is able to make that transformation. If you've had a near-death experience, it's a lot easier because you already have that absolute understanding that life is not the final word. But I absolutely believe that anyone can make that transformation. But it takes effort. I think it takes collecting data. And it's a matter of usually writing things down. I mean, maybe other people have better memories than I do, but usually it's writing things down and it's looking retrospectively at events in your life and how you came to those events. It's looking at things in your life that maybe your knee-jerk response is, oh, that was terrible. But then looking at it differently and trying to look at the incredible things that came out of that event. In a thousand years, I would never have looked at my parents' divorce and thought, oh, hey, this is gonna be great. <laughs> I was, you know, I was a young teenager it was devastating. And at the time, I thought God was, well, I won't use the, the language that I used at the time, <laughs> but I was angry. I was a very angry person because it didn't fall in line with what I thought should happen. And it took many years for me to then look back at that event and be so incredibly grateful because without that, my stepfather wouldn't have come into my life. And he today, don't tell my husband, <laughs> but he to date is, has been the greatest influence on my life of any human being. And so you can look back at your life and you can look at events like that. And they occur in every person's life. You can look at the way God has led you. You can look at the way God has loved you. You can look at the miracles that have occurred. And I absolutely believe miracles occur in every person's life. It's a matter of whether we acknowledge them. I've had to let go of control and expectations and comparisons. I have some dear friends that are native uh, indigenous people. And there's a beautiful story that I was told once because I asked about that. How do I control? How do I fix? How do I make? And this wise elder said, no, no, no. And then he told a story. He said, when you get in the river, when you fight the current, the harder you try to swim, you sink. He said, when you relax, when you let go, when you go with the flow, the current will take you exactly where you're meant to be. And it's interesting. I've been in the water. Swimming is one of the only things I can do anymore that, <laughs> where I move my body, but it's true. The harder you fight the water, the faster you sink. And if you just let go and relax and float, it's peaceful. It's easy and there is order in the universe. We'll be exactly where we're meant to be. I knew coming back that I was not gonna be able to remember everything I had learned, but that I would remember the important things. That everything is okay. That my life was proceeding just the way it was supposed to. That I am securely and eternally loved. That God is right now holding me in his arms. There is nothing that I can do to get away from him. There is nothing I can do to make him mad or to surprise him or to disappoint him. There is no punishment awaiting me. There is only an awakening into brilliant light and bliss. That I am being washed over, guided and loved. That my mistakes are like the stumbles of a toddler learning to walk to God. There is nothing to feel guilty about. There is nothing to feel afraid of. There is only lessons to learn and experiences to be had. Everything is okay. There is nothing for you to feel guilty for, nothing for you to feel ashamed of, nothing for you to be afraid of. Impossible 
for you to be alone, let alone eternally lost. There is no judgment awaiting you. This life was planned between us and you, and it is progressing exactly as it is supposed to, and we are so proud of you, and there is nothing that you could do to mess it up because the plan is so much bigger that it is capable of encompassing and bringing into balance any choice that you could make. And we know that from your perspective, when you're immersed in it, this life can be so incredibly difficult, but you are guided, safe, and loved every step of the way. There is never a time when you are actually in danger. Everything that exists is the brilliant divine light. You are swimming in an infinite ocean of magnetic, all-consuming love. It's what you are and you can't get away from it if you tried. Maar in essentie ligt onder al die traumata, daar ligt gewoon je bodem. En die zielenbodem, die kan niemand van je afnemen. Die vrijheid van die ziel kan niemand van je afnemen, ook een kamp niet. En elke keer word ik dus gewekt in mijn leven aan die allereerste oorsprong die elke beperking te boven gaat. Maar ik ben ook mens genoeg om er vaak zo een beetje eronder te zitten en dan krijg ik weer een schop van, de, van oh ja, oh ja, oh ja, ik vergeet het weer. Dus zo, zo gaat dat. I am me and me is enough just the way I am. And uh, I can be my contribution in this universe without even trying by just simply being, just being me. So God swept me and showed me all of earth. And in showing me all of earth, I saw that the length of my life was the wink of an eye. And timelessness, time has no meaning. And I saw every human being on earth individualized. And I saw them loved in the same way that I was loved in heaven. And God said to me, in the way that I love you now, you know that I've always loved you. And it was self-evident to me that God's love is the, the size of the cosmos, the, the, the billions and billions of years that the universe has existed. And the greatest love I'd ever experienced in my life was a speck of dust in comparison. The immensity and infinity in infinite love of God is unbelievably overwhelming. And that's the love I'd always been loved with. And I knew that to be true. And I knew that every single human being was loved in the same way. But the difference between the human beings and me was that they couldn't see. They were still in the world with a veil, not knowing the immensity of love. Couldn't know it, not built into the structure but still loved nonetheless. And God showed me my parents in particular, and I could see their faces and I could see their suffering. And God said to me, all will be well with them because all has always been well and all will be well and all is well because I love them. And you know this to be true. And I knew it to be true that in the end, my parents would no longer suffer because in death, they would be immersed in the ocean of love. And we're divine beings and we're here to make the world a better place and literally create peace and joy for everyone. I have no doubt we could do it. We're powerful, powerful people. Any community is very powerful when they step up and decide and choose a difference. I mean, never underestimate the power of a small group of people who are focused on change. There's thousands of examples and thousands of barriers that have been overcome where people find peace, they come together, and I think humanity's awakening and actually doing it worldwide. And that's what I learned. I need to change myself and that changes the world. If there's any message that I can give, it's not about meditating and leaving your body and taking your light being out of this earth. Indeed not. It is about bringing the light into this earth. Stay here. Be an anchor. 
let the light come in through you into this world don't abandon this world we need you we need you here we need you to be present and, and we need you to be open with an open heart and um, I also discovered that God has a sense of humor because we chuckled at some of the events that we looked at and that was very relieving to me. God is not judge, or in my experience of all this, not judgmental in any way at all. As we as we view all those things, we we started to laugh at how serious I was taking life. Now come on, Andy, yeah. really now. And it was fantastic, and 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 it was so and it was so fun because the light is really very humorous. It's a fun place to be. It's it, it's kind of like McDonald's on steroids. It's a fun place. <laughs> but but they love all of us, and they have an incredible sense of humor, and they always remind me, remember to laugh. Because being a spirit, trying to be a human, is probably one of the funniest things in the universe. <laughs>